Hi everyone, welcome to Here We Are, Brattleboro's Community Talk Show. I'm Wendy O'Connell. We are back here in the studio. Today our guest is Gordon Hayward. Gordon Hayward is a gardener and that is putting it mildly. He gives lectures across the country and garden tours throughout England. He's an acclaimed garden designer and author of 10 books on gardening. He also wrote for Blair and Ketchum's Country Journal magazine, which started here in Brattleboro, and for Horticulture magazine for 25 years. On their one and a half acres in Westminster West, Gordon and his wife Mary have created gardens of poetic beauty, elegant design, and gorgeousness, which they graciously open to the public for various events. Gordon, welcome. Thank you for asking me. Yeah, it's great to have you on the show. Good and to be here. We're catching you before you're in full flower, yes. so to speak. <laughs> right. <laughs> before yeah. you're really out there every yeah. day. Um, so, Gordon, um, I know that you grew up in um, New Hartford, Connecticut on a family orchard. Mm -hmm. And one thing you said about that was, the beauty of long rows of fruit trees in bloom was ingrained in my memory. Yeah, that was a big part of my childhood. Somehow, in the midst of all of the work that we did, pruning and thinning peaches and all of the other work that it went into producing fruit, um, was this deep awareness of the beauty of the place. Mm. It had been, uh, the, the farm had been f probably founded in the late 1700s, and uh, so there were beautiful stone walls that were all covered in lichen, and uh, those edged most of the orchards. Mm -hmm. And we had views in three directions of 20 miles. It was such a beautiful place to live, and completely surrounded by forests and woodland. So it was a pretty idyllic place to grow up in. Yes, and you had two other brothers, so you were a family working this orchard. Yeah, the farm. it was my mother and father and my brother John, my brother Peter, who's running the orchard now, and his son is going to take it over. So it will be third generation. That's very impressive, yeah. isn't it? It's yeah. really wonderful. And has the surrounding area changed a lot? Well, it, it has to a degree. Uh, my, my grandfather bought the property in 1929, he bought it with 5,000 acres of water district land adjacent to two of the boundaries of the farm. And then the other side was all woodland. Uh, so we were completely surrounded by thousands of acres of woods. Having said that, um, within the last 15 or 20 years, uh, what had been rural Connecticut is now suburban Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Right, right, yes. Because it's just 20 miles from Hartford, so it's... Uh, it's amazing that it's still somewhat rural, though. Yeah, that one little corner is yeah. mm -hmm. very, very much so. Mm -hmm. Well, the family business sounds like it has had a hand in keeping it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah it has. And when you were growing up, I know that um, you guys worked it. You worked it hard. Yeah. Yeah, it's not an easy life running a farm like right. that. We sold all of the fruit right out of the barn. And uh, so my, my brothers and my, my father and I particularly uh, prepared all of the half bushels of and pecks and four quarts of peaches, yeah. apples, and pears. And people from all over the area would come, uh, mostly on the weekends, but really seven days a week. Uh, Mrs. Jones of Jones and Lamson used to come down from Springfield every year when Dad would call her just before she came down because she loved his J.H. Hale peaches. They were as big as grapefruit. Wow and amazing peaches. And Mrs. Lamson would show up in her chauffeur-driven Cadillac uh, once, <laughs> once every summer to pick up her two half bushels of J.H. Hale peaches. But we had the whole range of people uh, yeah. across the socioeconomic range. Right. And that had a lot to do with my uh, being comfortable with everybody, mm -hmm. being comfortable with people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because my parents were. Right, that's right. And it was all first name basis. They knew virtually everybody who came to the farm. Yeah. And why didn't you bring the dogs? You brought them last week. <laughs> that sort of thing. Along with, um, with the farm, uh, you also were very interested in reading and literature at an early age. And was there an influence for that? Well, it was my father, uh, really. He, he, had, he had come from a banking family in Long Island and uh, 
he didn't want to know about a bank or a desk for the rest of his life. So he moved up to this, what was then the summer home, and started an orchard. And uh, my, sis my, my uh, father's sister had graduated from Goucher uh, not many years after dad moved. And I think he always rued the day that he didn't go on to college because ah. he was very bright. And um, dad started reading. And every winter of my childhood, uh, he would read uh, very systematically every winter. So he would go to bed at 8.30 or 9 at night, and for two winters he read nothing but the history of the Civil War. Another winter he read all of Shakespeare twice. And when I was in the eighth grade, he bought us Compton's Pictured Encyclopedia and read the whole thing that winter. Oh my gosh. So that was the, and then he would tell us uh, what he'd read the night before at yeah. breakfast. Yeah. And so both, uh, I was an English major, both my brothers were history majors, oh. and I think it was a direct result of dad's tutelage. Another important thing that my father did was um, he got wind of the fact that the Munn family, who was the first black family that, it had, uh, we, that my brother and I had ever met, uh, had been rejected by two of the three churches in New Hartford. And dad was going to have none of that. So he contacted them. And one morning, uh, one Sunday morning, we were at church, uh, all 26 of us in the back two pews. And um, we heard the creaking of the door and we knew everybody was there. And we turned around and this black couple in their 40s came into the sanctuary. And uh, dad said, move over, boys. And in that sentence integrated the churches of New Hartford. That's beautiful. Yeah, it was a beautiful moment. Yeah, very much so, and yeah. stuck with you, and probably everybody else in that congregation, it did. too. yeah. Yeah. At a young age, when you were, we were still in the family farm, did you have any interest in gardening, like that other kinds of gardening, vegetables, or, um, you know, I'm getting to, to where your love of yeah, garden design yeah. came from? Well, my parents had a large vegetable garden, probably a quarter of an acre, and it was tended to perfection. Not one weed was allowed to grow in that garden. So that was a big part of it. But the other part was uh, that somehow when I was maybe 14, I started working for a friend of theirs, a Dr. Sherneman, working on his, uh, in his garden and mowing his lawns. And I remembered at the age of 14, uh, making a woodland walk for a friend of theirs, wow. uh, a woman named Fran Holmes. And so that, that notion of organizing space, of creating gardens, of growing things, yes. uh, somehow was in me right from the start. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you remember as a kid um, in those kind of, I wouldn't call them wanderings because you were probably working the whole time, <laughs> but do you remember having relationship with plants in particular? Well, we had two, two neighbors. They were elderly school teachers from um, Pennsylvania, and they lived in a 1720 uh, farmhouse just down the road from us uh, during the summer. And they had Johnny Jump Ups in their garden. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the first time that I, I, first memory I have of a flower. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. Oh. And every time we went to, they always invited us on a Sunday afternoon to go down and, and they would give us candy corn. And we would sit and have polite conversation with them. And I would always look out at the window and see how the Johnny Jump Ups were oh, that's, doing. That's, yeah. I think it's partly the name too, because I remember Johnny Jump Ups yeah. as a kid. And yeah. they almost have little faces. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Did you have other interests growing up as a younger person, middle school or teenage? Did you do art, music, or do you have time for anything else? Um, well, we worked most of the time. I have to say there was one, one very deep memory I have was, was, was of Bill Andrus, who was a hermit who lived up in the woods. He lived about a mile into the woods from the farm. And my brother John and I would go up there um, maybe twice a month to, uh, and Bill would show us what, we, what he was growing in his 
gardens. Uh, he, he had about three acres of land that he'd cleared, uh, built a house in a barn that uh, had been in, in his family's property. And he would take us out into the woods to teach us about mm -hmm. the life in the woods. Oh. And what was the difference between a crow's nest and a squirrel's nest? And uh, he would show us tracks of animals. And oh, wow. So that was an extraordinary uh, time. And this was in the 50s. Right. And uh, so that was, a, that was a deep memory. Mm -hmm. um, That's a big influence and an education. Yeah. Because you remember that stuff, yeah, right? Oh, yeah, very much yeah. so. He used to help my father with his scythe in the orchards. And he would sharpen his uh, scythe with a little anvil, which he would uh, tap into a tree trunk and then sharpen it with a ball peen hammer. He never used it. Uh, wow. So it was. Wow. Yeah. Old timers. Yeah. Yeah. Old we timers. grew up. We grew up with them. Yeah. But I was I love swimming every Sunday afternoon uh, during the summer after we finish work. Myself and a lot of our, our friends our age would go down to a swimming hole uh -huh. that uh, had been made by a New York caterer who had a wonderful property just down the road from us. And we would all gather there and swim and our mothers would all be there. And oh. We would just have a wonderful yeah, time. Yeah, Stay, being outside, you know, our generation, yeah. we were outside a lot. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and you at some point became a rower. Yeah, I, I, I left uh, public high school after my junior year and went to South Kent School. And during that time, um, I was already 6'4 at that point. Wow. And uh, I went for my interview, and uh, Bruce Small, who was the crew coach at South Kent, uh, came up to me as I was having lunch uh, just after my interview, and he said, you're going to get in and you're going to row. And... I did both. You did. And so I, so I was, I had tried to play basketball rather half-heartedly being 6'4", yeah. uh, but I could not get that ball into the hoop. I just could not do it. And I really didn't want to somehow. But I got into that four-oar racing shell and the equipment was so beautiful. Yes. And I love the anonymity that there were no stars in a, in a, in a shell. Everybody huh. was equal. And uh, I was built, my body was built for the sport. Mm -hmm. And so I got into the first boat in my second year there, and we just won every race we wow. rode in. Wow. I went to Cornell uh, primarily to row, but also to, to study, of course. But uh, that, uh, I just found Cornell too huge and anonymous. And, uh -huh. I left there and, and uh, moved into New York City and, and worked as a trainee for a while at National City Bank. But that following fall, I started at Marietta College in Ohio, one of the small college rowing schools. And uh, the Dad Vale was, one of, was the small college championship on the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia. And in my junior year, we swept the Dad Vale. The, the freshman JV and varsity won all three races, and it hadn't been done ever. <laughs> so great. Well, so, congratulations. Yeah, <laughs> that was a great memory. And you did coming from this. You did um, you did a lot of traveling. You did traveling on your own. You went through Europe, and um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that travel informed you. I mean, at that point, were you looking at gardens? Were you thinking about being in the natural world in some way? Right. Well, the, the traveling was intimately related to a course I took at Columbia in art history. And mm -hmm. a professor uh, assigned us the task of sitting in front of a single painting in one of the great museums of New York for two to two and a half hours. And I did that, and it was life-changing. Yeah. So after I graduated from Marietta, I taught at Litchfield High School and uh, left there in 1974 and traveled on my own across Europe for almost a year. Mm -hmm. And that sitting in front of that Mannerist painting at the Metropolitan for two and a half hours informed that travel. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. And so I was, I was in Paris. It happened to be the centenary of, or centennial of the 
Impressionist movement. Mm -hmm. And so I was in Paris for that. And then I went across, I was in Amsterdam. Uh, I was in Scandinavia, I was in Moscow wow, and wow. Leningrad and looking at the Impressionists all throughout wow. it. And not gardens, but what I was doing uh, unwittingly was training my eye. Yes. I was learning how to see. Yes, and that comes right to the present with your new book yeah. called Art and the Garden. Yeah. You've got a wonderful painting of Rousseau's, which yeah. I have to say does remind me in the layers that you have in your, you and Mary have created in your garden, mm -hmm. the many layers and the many depths and the, the way the light comes in. Yeah. There's something really wonderful about yeah. that. Yeah. Let's talk about how you met Mary. Well, Mary had been teaching with my brother John, who taught at Brattleboro High School for a year or two. Uh -huh. uh, he taught uh, with, with Mary in Bristol, England. So when they decided to return to New England and they, they bought a house in Walpole, New Hampshire, uh, they invited Mary to come spend the summer with them. Uh -huh. And I'd been at that time uh, out in the West Coast and I was bringing their furniture east from Berkeley, California, where they had been living before they went to England. And we met uh, unloading their furniture in Walpole. And I was smitten. And invited her to come with me down to the Berkshires. I was living in a commune then in, in, uh, in uh, Lenox, near Lenox, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And um, Mary agreed, and uh, we got married a month later. <laughs> so great. I love that story. That's fantastic. And somewhere in there, you both worked at Alice's Restaurant, I believe. We did. That summer, I've been t I taught for two years at, at Mount Everett High School in Sheffield, Mass., and then that summer, I left there, and we worked it out with Alice Brock at her uh, pleasure palace on the hill, just outside Lenox. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, and we saved up five thousand mm -hmm. dollars and had an outrageous summer with uh, that whole scene at Alice's. With was it pretty cool? Well, Leonard Bernstein coming in uh -huh. and Pauline Keel from the New York oh, wow. Film Review. Mm -hmm. and, you know the, that sort of. Um, Luminaries from all over the East yeah. uh, were coming through. That's so great. And uh, Mary had one extraordinary evening as a uh, farmer's daughter from the Cotswolds being asked to be a cocktail waitress. <laughs> so that lasted for four hours. <laughs> but we had a wonderful time. And then that's when we, we saved up money for travel. After you and Mary had a whirlwind courtship of one month, yes. um, and you went traveling yeah. um, and went to a lot of very cool places, um, when you came back, what was your plan at that point? I had uh, gotten a job at Brattleboro High School. Yay. And George Lewis hired me. Mm -hmm. uh, this was um, in 1970. 78 or 79, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was 79, and I, I taught English at the high school for, uh, five, for six years and loved every minute of it. I had just some of the most wonderful memories of that, some of the great students. Yeah. Um, Including and, our former our former town manager, Peter Elwell. Yeah, Peter yes. Elwell was a yeah. student, and mm -hmm. Jenny Backus, and... Uh, Ellen Luna, and, uh, oh, the list goes on, yeah. uh, Kyle Herbert, Sayward Robinson, remember B. Robinson's oh, yes. clothing store right. in Brattleboro? Yeah. B. Robinson's daughter, Sayward, wrote a piece for me called Side Hill Plow, uh, which was an evocation of her watching a, a, an old farmer plowing the side hill at their place out in Newfane. And uh, it was just extraordinary. And I sent it to Mel Allen at Yankee Magazine. I mm -hmm. said, you thought you'd like to see uh, one of my students' works. And he printed, he published it oh, in very Yankee. Excellent. Yeah. That's really yeah. cool. And you, so you did some work for Blair and Ketchum's Country Journal, which I think many of us in Brattleboro remember. That yeah. this was the hometown magazine, which yeah. took off. And I guess it was sold, I think, in 84 to a larger company. Yeah. But you wrote for them? Well, when we were living in Stockbridge, uh, I had just come back from a, a College of the Atlantic Whale Watch on the Gulf, out on the uh, Gulf of Maine on Mount Desert Rock Light Station. 
and uh, I wrote an article for, uh, well, I wrote an article, and it was the second article I'd ever written, really, and uh, I sent it to Blair and Ketchum's, and they took it. And I remember coming out of the post office in Stockbridge when we were living there, and there was a check for $300. Wow. Which meant that somebody was prepared to pay me for what I wrote. And I can't tell you what an encouragement that was. What a revelation, right? Yeah, yeah. it was. Yeah. It was after that um, article in Blair and Ketchum's that we were living in England after our tour around Europe. Mm. And I approached uh, Horticulture Magazine in Boston uh, about articles from England. And because I had a link with John Barstow, who was one of the editors there, having grown up very near him in, in Norfolk, Connecticut, the result of that was that I started, I published my first article in horticulture in 1979 on a, a deputy head gardener at the Hidkett Manor Gardens who had mm. been trained in the old apprenticeship system. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was my first piece. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that launched me really into the very heart of, of American garden writing yes. at the time. And that went on for 25 years. Yes. England was my teacher, mm. really. Mm -hmm. uh, England was my garden design teacher. I never took a course in the subject. Mm. But what Mary and I did do, because we were, we were living there in, in 1978 into 79, and we would, um, I, was, I was restoring a garden just just downhill from the Stow on the Wold in the little village of Broadwell for one pound an hour. And um, so I was working in the garden, but we were living literally across the field from the Hitkit Manor Gardens. Mm. And it was the first garden of rooms in England. Yeah. Vita Sackville West and her husband came to see Hitkit and went back to create Sissinghurst uh -huh. as, a, as a garden of yes. rooms. This is as opposed to the big estate gardens with the 700 acres of fields mm -hmm. and big lakes and a mile long driveway, that sort of gardening. Right. Whereas Lawrence Johnston, who was from Baltimore and an American, had created these intimate spaces of it. It's right. a 16 acre garden, but it was a set of half acre, quarter acre, intimate spaces yes. that he made, one for his mother, for example. Yes, yes. So it was a garden of human scale and mm -hmm. yet very sophisticated at the same time. And uh, I've probably been to that garden 40 times oh, wow. now. And it was yes. the garden that I learned. Yes. And, uh, and you and Mary together wrote a book called The Intimate Garden, right. Yeah, which yeah. is a lot about that. And right. I, I, I do I understand what you're saying about the scale, you know, yeah. And, yeah. and that's so evident in yeah. all of your gardens. Yeah. But the other part of what I learned in England was that Mary and I, were, she having been brought up on a farm uh, nearby where we were living, uh, had this deep affinity for the natural world. Mm. And so we were going off to look at gardens across southern England. I think we've probably seen 200 gardens over the years. Yes. And uh, the result of that is uh, a deep understanding of the principles of garden design. Right but uh, certainly a, a knowledge of plants, mm -hmm. and that, the, those were my teachers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you've taken people back there on tours. You worked with Travel Smiths in yeah, town for a while. Yeah, one of our early tours yeah. was with Rick and Randy Smith at uh -huh, Travel Smiths. Uh -huh. But yeah, we took uh, 15 garden groups from, from the Northeast and Chevy Chase, Maryland. That was another learning experience that uh, where I was not only learning as we went to these gardens, but I was also teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that and, was a combination of And probably the two. learning so much more with teaching because exactly. people are asking questions yes. and you're having to evaluate in a right. different kind of yeah. way. Right. Yeah, I would think that would be fascinating. Yeah. Gordon, you've taught, you've lectured, you've done tours, you've written books, you've been in the land, you've made these gardens. Um, what, what gives you, I think they probably all give you a lot of satisfaction. Um, I'm just guessing at that. But are there things that stand out for you, like looking looking back now at all the things you've done, um, what are the things that, that jump up as things that are vibrant and vivifying? Well, I think the time that Mary and I have shared together in Westminster West mm -hmm. 
is clearly the, the most important and the most moving and uh, enlivening experience of, of my life and I think our lives. It is the first thing we did was to buy a 1790s era uh, farmhouse in broken down condition and uh, thanks to Merrill Redfield at the uh, Brattleboro Savings and Loan, he gave us a, a loan of $30,000 mortgage. So first of all was the restoration of that house, which we did virtually uh, ourselves with the exception of Dan Cassidy and Victor Olson who helped us. But um, it was the restoration of that house and then the deepest satisfaction is clearly the garden that Mary and I have made together mm. over 35 years mm -hmm. and um, doing 98% of the work ourselves yes. right from the beginning yeah. and to create it from a, from a broken down uh, rubbish strewn place to uh, a, a, quite a fine garden is a source of great satisfaction to both of us. Quite a fine garden indeed. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> to go into that garden I think that one feels immediately at home mm -hmm. and there's something very comforting about it as you say the different rooms that you've created but also the fact that there's such um, such an array of uh, familiarity you know old stone walls mm -hmm. and trees in certain places and the mm -hmm. colors and everything I was thinking about um, you know a painter has a palette mm -hmm. right and also you know, something that's about that size to yes. work with. Yeah. You're working with... An acre not, and a half. An acre and a half. Yeah. Not only that, but um, a palette which is um, almost infinite mm -hmm. and, uh, and at the vagaries of weather and all kinds of other things. Yeah. So yeah. it's really yeah. a remarkable thing that you and Mary have right. done. Well, one of the things that, that we were able to make a part of the garden is the history of the place. Mm. That is that Philip Rennie's ancestors, Philip Rennie uh, grew up right across the road from, from our house, where our house is. And uh, Philip's ancestors in the late 1700s built a, a farm there and farmed it up until we bought it. We were the first people outside of the family mm. to own it. Mm -hmm. And so the old milking parlor is still there. Uh, where the barn was, the uh, silo base is the pool at the back of our garden. Uh, the mound that we have was an old um, mound that would have been built by the Rannies to uh, gravity feed the maple sap vats uh. down into where our dining room is, which is where the sugar house was. Oh, oh. All the stone walls around two sides of the garden uh, were all built by the Rannies. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's the quote from the past and the heart of the Rannies, who I might hasten to add, also cleared by hand probably 150 acres of virgin forest. And that's all the meadows that are around yes, us. Yeah, yeah. So it's an extraordinary evocation of the Rannies' spirit in, in that place. And then... Uh, not the least of which is a hundred-year-old St. Lawrence apple tree at the bottom of the garden uh -huh. uh, where Seth and Catherine, uh, Seth Knopp and Catherine Stefan got oh. married a oh. few years ago. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, so the first heart of the garden is coming from the Rannies. And then the second is our knowledge of the room, the Garden of Rooms at Hidcote. And so we decided, we asked ourselves, what is the nature of this space, mm. this specific space mm -hmm. in the garden, and how can we make a garden in that area that honors that space, mm -hmm. that defines that space, mm -hmm. that gives life to it? Yes. And so the garden told us how to design itself, yes. in a way. Yes. And this is what you refer to as the inevitable garden. Yeah. Right. And that's the inevitable part, inevitable part of our garden, is the front door of our garden, built by the Rannies, of course, is, is right on line with that apple tree that uh -huh. the Rannies planted 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that line is the dominant line of the whole garden and we strung beads on a string. I mean, we literally tied a string to that door yeah. and ran it 250 feet out to the apple tree. Every line in the garden is parallel or perpendicular to that string. Ah, so, it's, so, so it has it a all, primal axis yes, going on. It yes, it does. 
Gordon, what you and Mary have done is really remarkable, and all of the books that you've done are fantastic guides and beautiful books in their own way, too. Um, and you are going to have the garden open again this summer for a few specific events. Yes. Um, they, uh, nonprofit, yep. usually. Yes. yes. Yeah, yes. Yep. So people should stay tuned for that. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Good. Thanks to all of you for joining us today with Gordon Hayward. Um, I do hope that uh, you will keep an eye out for the different events this summer. Um, the website will follow uh, with the credits um, after I stop talking, which is going to be very soon. So <laughs> thanks for joining us so much. And again, we thank Gordon. Um, and um, a big shout out to Mary also for all, that, all the work that's been done and all the love that's been put into that one and a half acres. Thank you. Stay tuned. We'll be back. Thank you.